Okay, the last part of this chapter four, unsteady flow process. So to study this, let's come up with the energy balance equation and the mass balance equation. The mass balance equation is the sum of mass into a system minus the sum of mass out of the system should be the same as the change of mass of the system. You may remember when we studied steady flow open system, we added a dot on top of it because you know it was convenient to use a rate form when we have steady state system. However, when we have a transient system like unsteady system, we don't do that. Okay, so there's no dot on top of it. And how can you determine the change of energy of a system? It's simple. Final mass m2 minus the initial mass m1. So the change, the difference between mass transfer in and out should be the same as m2 minus m1. That is the mass balance equation for an unsteady open system. <laughs> If you want to study energy balance equation for an unsteady system, we can use this one, energy transfer in minus energy transfer out is going to be the change delta in energy of the system. So we can consider three different energy transfers. They can be E transfer Q, energy transfer by work W and mass transfer, which is mass times H velocity square over two times potential energy. So let's do that. For this energy transfer into a system can be either heat transfer Q, energy transfer by work W, or mass transfer that can be mass that goes into a system and in. This mass entering the system has enthalpy H, kinetic energy, velocity square over 2, plus potential energy, gravity, elevation, Z. So these are energy transfer into a system. What about energy transfer out of the system? We use the same thing. T transfer Q, energy transfer by work W, plus mass transfer, mass leaves the system, which is M out. This has enthalpy, kinetic energy, and potential energy. The difference between these two is the change of energy of a system. How do we determine the change of energy of a system? The final energy, E2, minus the initial energy, E1. So how do you determine the final energy and the initial energy? Mass times internal energy, U plus kinetic energy and potential energy. The one thing you need to be careful here is that we have internal energy, U, instead of enthalpy H because when there is a mass transfer in and out, there is a flow energy is added to the system. That's why we have H for incoming or outgoing mass. However, if you want to only consider the total energy of the system before and after process, there is no flow energy. So we have internal energy U instead of H. By the way, at the end, we need to have the moving boundary work that we studied in chapter three. So starting with this one, mass, the final mass M2, this has internal energy U2 plus kinetic energy V2 square over two plus potential energy gravity elevation Z2 minus M1, this has internal energy U1 plus kinetic energy V1 square over 2 plus potential energy gravity elevation Z2 plus moving boundary work WB. So this is the energy balance equation. So mass balance 
energy balance, and that's it. And we can use these two equations for a given problem. And we need to evaluate each term one by one. Which is a little bit different from steady state open system where we studied the simple energy balance equations for each devices such as nozzle diffuser, turbine compressor, and etc. We studied how to determine the energy balance equation for each system. However, there's no standard, you know, the procedure for unsteady system. So you have to use the entire equation every time, okay? And based on these two governing equations, let's solve this problem. By the way, any question about the energy balance equation that we just studied? If not, then this problem. An insulated vertical piston cylinder device. So you hear that insulated. What does it mean? We have a good insulation, therefore we can minimize heat transfer so you can neglect energy transfer by heat. So let's remove Q in and Q out. Initially contains 10 kilograms of water. So we have the mass at the initial state. M in? No, that is the incoming mass. M out? That is the outgoing mass. M2? The final mass. M1? That is the initial mass. So from here, M1 is 10 kilograms. So we have the information at the initial state, which is number one. Six kilograms of which is in the vapor phase. So we have four kilograms of liquid, six kilograms of vapor. When do we have liquid and vapor together? When the phase change process is number three, saturated mixture. So at the initial state number one, we have phase change process number three. It is a saturated mixture and the quality X. By the way, quality X is the mass of the vapor over the mass of the liquid plus the mass of the vapor. And the vapor is six kilograms. Liquid is four kilograms. So six over four plus six, that is 10. So X is 0.6. And it is a constant pressure process. Therefore, P1 is 200 kilopascal. Constant pressure process means the pressure at the end of this process, which is P2, is also 200 kilopascal. If you have constant pressure process, the moving boundary work is pressure P times V2 minus V1. That's what we studied in chapter 3. Now, steam at Four megapascal, or there's a typo. It's not 0.4, it is just four. Steam at four megapascal, 360 degrees Celsius is allowed to enter the cylinder from a supply line. So we have the information at the inlet, which is right here, inlet P1. 
key in the inlet pressure is 4 megapascal. Inlet temperature T in is 360 degree Celsius. Now it is allowed to enter the cylinder from a supply line until all the liquid in the cylinder has vaporized. That means that at the end of this process, everything is in the vapor phase. So just to finish it, the evaporation, that means that the phase change process number four, saturated vapor. So number two, at the end of this process, which is number two, it is a phase change process number four, saturated vapor. Now, we want to determine the final temperature in the cylinder and the mass of the steam that has entered. So we want to determine the temperature at the end of this process, which is T2. And we want to know the mass of the steam that entered. M dot, M, not M dot, M in. Okay. So let's solve this problem. We don't want to use this energy balances equation as is because it looks too complicated. So we are going to make some assumptions. The first of all, we don't have any other information in terms of any external work. So you can neglect energy transfer by work. There's no information about the velocity of the steam or, you know, the water already in the cylinder. So you can neglect kinetic energy change. And potential energy as well, unless the piston cylinder device is as tall as Mount Everest. So you can neglect them. We have the initial mass, of course. 10 kilograms. We have the final mass. We do not know the mass, but there should be final mass. So we have these two terms. And we have the incoming mass. Steam enters at 4 megapascal. However, there's no outgoing mass, so you can neglect that. So we only have the enthalpy at the inlet, initial enthalpy, final enthalpy and the moving boundary work, okay? So, let me rewrite that energy balance equation down here. M in times H in is M2 U2 minus M1 U1 plus moving boundary work is P V2 minus V1 However, you can see we took mass out of each term. So this V, capital V, is the actual volume. So we can say instead of V, mass times lowercase specific volume. We can do that. And since it is the, at the final state, we can say M2 V2. We have a pressure here that is going to be P2 minus the same thing, P M V, P one M one V one. Can we do that? Yes, because it's a constant pressure process. P one is the same as P two. We can say P, P one, P two, doesn't matter because it's a constant pressure process. And this capital V is mass times aspect volume. So we can say like that, plus, P2, M2, V2, minus P1, M1, V1. Can we do that? Yes. Now, we have M2, M2, M1, M1. So let's combine M2 together, M1 together. So we get mass that goes in times its specific enthalpy is 
M2 times U2 plus T2 V2 minus M1 times U1 plus P1 V1. Now, don't you think something looks familiar? Based on the definition of enthalpy H, H is U plus PV. So if you see here, there's a U2 plus P2 V2, U1 plus P1 V1. So this one is H2, this one is H1. So this equation becomes M in, H in is M2, H2 minus M1, H1. So this is the energy balance equation. By the way, the mass balance equation is here. So mass balance equation is M in minus M out is M2 minus M1. But you know there's no outgoing mass. So this is the mass balance equation. So we have these two equations. Any questions up to here? The flow energy pressure times volume was added at the incoming mass and outgoing mass. That's why we have enthalpy, right? As we studied in chapter four. And that flow energy is added because it is flowing into and out of the system. What about the initial energy and the final energy? There's no flow. So there's no flow energy that we need to include. That's why we have U instead of H for the initial energy and the final energy. On the other hand, this incoming energy should have H instead of U. Okay? So whenever something is flowing, then you want to consider that flow energy. Therefore, you use enthalpy rather than internal energy. However, when there is no flow, such as what was in what was in the cylinder, there is no flow. So for initial state number one, for the final state number two, you don't consider flow energy. That's why we have U instead of H. However, in this problem, we have a moving boundary work that has PV, which looks like flow energy. So you can also add that on top of this U to get H. So that's not the same way we got H. The previously incoming, you know, the mass, because of the flow, we had PV. But this time, we have a pressure times volume because it's a constant pressure process. And either way, we got H at the end. So you have H in, H1, H2 in the final equation. So we are going to solve these two equations to determine what? The unknown. What is the unknown? The mass of the steam that enters. So this one, this one is the unknown. This one is the unknown. What do we know? We know the initial mass. The initial mass was 10 kilograms. So this one is 10 kilograms. This one is 10 kilograms. So what do we need to determine? We need to determine H in, H1, H2. Then you can substitute this M2 into this equation. Because from here, M2, M2 is M in plus 10 kilograms. So this one can go into this equation here. So this equation becomes M in, H in is M in plus 
10 kilograms times H2 minus M1 H1, right? Here M1 is 10 kilograms. So we want to determine this one. And this one, they are the same thing. So let's find H1 first. To determine H1, we need to know the phase change process at the initial state, and we already know it is phase change process number three, saturated mixture. So if we have saturated mixture, how can you determine its specific enthalpy H? By using linear interpolation. In linear interpolation is HF plus quality X times HG minus HF. We can find this HG and HF at this condition, 200 kilopascal. Let's, let's go to 200 kilopascal here. Saturated water pressure table at 200 kilopascal, in other words, two bar. HF is this one, HG is this one. So let me write them down here. HF 504.7. HG, 2706.7. What is the quality X? 0 0.6. 0 0.6. So you can determine H1. If you do the calculation, you get 1825.84 kilojoule per kilogram. So this one goes in here. What about H2? What is the phase change process at number two? Saturated vapor. If you have saturated vapor, how can you determine its specific enthalpy? Hg at the given condition. What condition? 200 kilopascal. Where can you find Hg at 200 kilopascal? from the pressure table, which is right here. Pressure table at 200 kilopascal, HG is 2706.7. Oops, I'm sorry, 2706.7 kilojoule per kilogram. So this one goes in here. Now, we just need to know H in, that's all. And how can you determine H in? We need to know the phase change process at the inlet. What do we know? It is 4 megapascal, 360 degrees Celsius, high pressure, high temperature. Sounds like super heat vapor, but let's verify that. To determine, you know, that the phase change process, we can use property diagram. So I'm going to use this 4 megapascal at 4 megapascal we can make E something diagram, but since we are interested in specific enthalpy H, it will be convenient to use TH diagram, which looks like this. To complete this TH diagram, we need to know T set, HF, HG. However, we know the temperature. The temperature is 360 degrees Celsius. So we just need to know T set. What is T set at 4 mega Pascal? It is from this table at T set at 4 mega Pascal is 250.4. 250.4 degrees Celsius. What is the temperature at the inlet? 360. It's even higher than this number. So somewhere up here, that's just 360. What is the phase change process? One, two, three, four, and seven. No, five, right? Yeah, superheat vapor. So if you have a superheat vapor, then you go to superheat vapor table, table A4. 4 megapascal, 360 degrees Celsius, specific enthalpy is this number, 
3117.2. H in is 3117.2 kilojoule per kilogram. So this one goes here. So we have everything. Can you determine M in? Yes, we can. What is it? 21.46 21.46 kilograms of steam required but that's not the end what is the final temperature of the system what is the phase change process at the end saturated vapor at 200 kilopascal what is the temperature of saturated vapor? The saturation temperature at what condition? 200 kilopascal. So at 200 kilopascal, what is the saturation temperature? 120.2. That is the temperature at the end. T set at 200 kilopascal is 120.2 degrees Celsius. So that's how you solve this problem. And that completes chapter four. So now you can see, you, 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 can, you can get the long waiting homework assignment that you are waiting for. So uh, we have a new homework assignment for chapter four. It is due a week from today. today is Thursday, so next Thursday by four by two PM. So you have a new homework assignment for chapter four. Any question about this problem or chapter four? Or thermodynamics? Or everything else? What's going on in the world? I don't know. Any question about chapter four? No. Okay. So that completes chapter four. Let's go to chapter five. The second law of thermodynamics, in my opinion, in my opinion, this chapter is the easiest one. I know that you 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 study hard for chapter three, uh, chapter four, so it's time for a break. Chapter five is the easiest one. So let me show you how easy easy it is. So in chapter five, we are going to combine, you know, the multiple thermodynamic devices such as heat exchanger, turbine, compressor, pump, nozzle, all together to make a cycle. So we are going to study three different cycles. They are heat engine, refrigeration, and heat pump, okay? So we are going to study heat engine, refrigeration, and heat pump. So heat engine is a device to produce mechanical energy from thermal energy and refrigeration refrigeration system is a device to convert mechanical energy into thermal energy and heat pump is the same thing okay to understand these three cycles that we need to you know the understand one you know the uh, concept that is called thermal energy reservoir Thermal energy reservoir is a hypothetical body with a relatively large thermal energy. So it has a large energy. So even though you take some heat out of it, it doesn't change. Just too much. Like a billionaire, you take 50, 20 bucks from a billionaire, his account stays the same, right? No, there's a $20, $20 negative, and but there's a, another million dollar goes up every day, right? So it is always that is just trying to show the concept of this thermal energy reservoir. So our assumption is that 
the amount of this energy is too much. So even though it absorbs some energy from our system or releases some energy into our system, it doesn't change. That is thermal energy reservoir. Where do we use this concept? This concept is very useful to simplify, you know, the mechanical, you know, the system. Uh, let's talk about, you know, the power plant. How do we, you know, the uh, use, how do we turn on this light by using electricity? Supposed to be, you know, the producer somewhere, you know, the away, there's a power plant nearby this town that produces, you know, this electricity and supply to us. So how this, you know, the power plant works? Maybe, you know, there's someone, you know, the operating this power plant, you know, the wake up at 7 a.m. and then turn on the power plant and the power plant is running for three hours and then stop about, you know, the uh, 10 a.m. and then wait, go to lunch and then come back at 2 p.m., turn on the power plant and then produce electricity for another three hours, something like that? No, no, because it costs a lot of money to store electricity, so we do not store electricity. When they produce, when we use it or we lose it. Okay, so the power plants are working 24 hour, 24 seven. So the electricity that we consume is the electricity they just created. So we use, we consume the electricity that is produced at the same time. So it runs continuously. So if we have, you know, if we want to look at this power plant system, we have a steam generator so where steam is generated, the steam enters turbine that we studied in the previous chapter. So turbine. So that is, you know, the, the, the this high temperature, high pressure steam expands in the turbine. So that will push this turbine blade. That's how we produce mechanical work that is coupled with the generator that will produce electricity. And there's a, you know, the low temperature, low pressure water is going to be removed from this steam and uh, from this turbine, and it still has some energy, waste heat. We need to get rid of it. By how? By running, you know, the, by using coolant from nature, such as water from a nearby river or lake or ocean. So we have a condenser to use, you know, the coolant from nearby lake. So this, this is a lake, Lake Isabella or something, Michigan Lake. So we use this water to cool this, you know, the steam. Then now it enters a pump to pump this, you know, the water back to this steam generator. So that's how we produce electricity continuously. To produce that, you know, the electric, you know, the power continuously, what we need to do, we need to continuously provide, you know, the heat. By how? By burning fossil fuels, maybe burn coal or burn natural gas or something. In that way, we produce heat that will generate steam. And it will produce work and waste heat is going to be removed by circulating this water from Michigan Lake. So there's a queue out from the condenser. So as a whole, this is going to be heat engine, which observed heat in the steam generator, produce work in the turbine and release waste heat in the condenser. That is heat engine. To continuously produce this work, this steam generator supposed to be at the same temperature, maybe 500 degrees Celsius or 600 degrees Celsius. So we can continuously burn this fossil fuel to generate heat. So we have an abundant amount of fuel that is thermal energy reservoir. We have a Michigan Lake, water from Michigan Lake, even though we release that waste heat, the temperature of the Michigan Lake is not going to increase. So that is another thermal energy reservoir and the constant temperature, even though we dump heat. 
into the into the lake. So we have two thermal energy reservoirs in this power plant system. Okay, so let's see how this heat engine works. The same thing as here. This heat engine absorbs heat from high temperature thermal energy reservoir, produce network, and release waste heat into low temperature thermal energy reservoir. So this heat engine works in this way. It absorbs heat from high temperature thermal energy reservoir, which is maintained at high temperature, and produce work. That work is produced and release any waste heat into low temperature thermal energy reservoir. So this is the schematic of heat engine. Okay. Then how can we analyze this heat engine? Very simple. We can consider the energy balance equation. By the way, is it a steady state system or unsteady system? What's going to happen if this is if this power plant become unsteady? What is the what is the you know the famous example of unsteady power plant? The nuclear power plant in Japan, the Fukushima power plant, that blown out. Why is that? Because their cooling system went off. So there's a That is more like, you know, the failing of controlling those. Yeah, the, the, the Japan one is more, you know, the mechanical energy, mechanical part. So, so that power plant, because of the tsunami, you know, the destroyed the pumping system. So the pumping, you know, the, the coolant circulation was stopped. Therefore, we couldn't dump waste heat. So it increases the temperature of the entire system that blown out, right? So there's an unsteady. What is the steady system? The power plants that's applying electricity to our campus. That is a steady state system. The temperature of the steam generator maintain constant. The temperature of the coolant maintain constant. So we can keep producing electricity. So when you have about when you talk about heat engine, refrigeration, or heat pump, or any system in chapter five, it should be steady state. There's only one moment it can be unsteady, complete shutdown of the power plant, right? So in general, it's going to be steady state. So when you have a steady state heat engine, how can you apply energy balance equation? The general energy balance equation is going to be energy transfer in minus energy transfer out is going to be the change of energy of a system. That is the general energy balance equation However, if it is a steady state, there's nothing changes with time. So this energy balance equation can be, you know, the, uh, simplified in this way. The energy transfer into a system is the same as energy transfer out of a system. This is the energy balance equation. So we have three energy transfers, QH, QF, and W net. Which one is incoming? Which one is outgoing? As simple. Just look at the direction of. Just look at the direction of arrow. This one is incoming energy transfer, outgoing energy transfer, outgoing energy transfer. We have one incoming energy transfer QH, two outgoing energy transfer QFL and W net. So this is the energy balance equation. Why don't we move this one to the other side? W net, net work that energy transfer by work is going to be the difference in heat transfer so this is the energy balance equation for heat engine is that it no there's another analysis that we can do what about there's a power plant to supply electricity to mount pleasant there's another power plant supplying electricity to Midland. So if you want to compare which one is better than the other, 
the simplest way to you know the compare these two is going to be what is the efficiency of the power plant in Mount Pleasant? What is the efficiency of the power plant in Midland? So how can you determine the efficiency? We studied this efficiency in chapter two. Simple desired output. over required input. So what is desired output? Why do you build a power plant? To produce electricity. So net work determined and developed by this power plant is going to be desired output. What is required input? We need to burn fossil fuels, right? To produce the heat. So this one is required input. So this is the efficiency. Or some people like to say, instead of W net, we can say QH minus QL. Yes, you can. So you can say QH minus QL over QH. In other words, 1 minus QL over QH. So this is everything about heat engine. Any question? That's it. We are going to study three different, you know, the systems, heat engine, refrigeration, heat pump. This is the first one. And that is the end of the story. I told you that chapter five is simple, right? Now we are going to solve two practice problems. And you will understand you know, why I told you that how easy it is. A heat engine that pumps water out of an underground mine accepts 700 kilojoules of heat and produces 250 kilojoules of work. How much heat does it reject? So what kind of heat engine is that? Geothermal power plant. So we pump water on the ground and because of the heat, The water becomes steam and comes out of, from the underground. We use that steam to run turbine to produce electricity and pump back down to the underground. That is geothermal power plant. So let's talk about just this geothermal power plant. What is the schematic of heat engine like that? Okay, so I'm going to use, I'm going to draw the same schematic. So there's a heat engine. It, re it requires two thermal energy reservoirs. So one is at high temperature, QH. The other one is at low temperature, QL. The difference between these two becomes uh, network developed. So what is the uh, energy balance equation? Right here, W net is QH minus QL. So what is, what is the, the amount of heat entering the system? 700, 700 kilojoule. What is the network developed? 250 kilojoule. What is the heat we need to reject to the environment? 700 minus 250, 450 kilojoule. Difficult? Not at all. Even my three-year-old boy can solve this one. No, he can't. He cannot read numbers. Not yet. <laughs> this one? Something like that. So you will see at least one problem from this chapter five. That means that either heat engine, refrigeration, or heat pump. You will see one of them. But if I give this problem in your exam, you will be very disappointed about this course. I totally understand. So let me, let me, you know, the, uh, make it a little harder. That is this one. But the concept is the same. Everything is shown on this slide, okay? So let me solve this problem. Now we are talking about car engine. Okay, so this automobile engine consumes fuel at a rate of 
22 liter per hour. When you see liter, hour, rather than meter and second, you must feel this way. Okay, this problem should be very easy. It's too easy. So whoever developed this problem made it ugly, like using liters or hours, isn't it? Maybe we can figure it out. Maybe, maybe. So let's see. You know, the one, usually when you see this kind of weird unit, when you do the all the unit conversions, the actual problem is going to be very simple. So this engine delivers 55 kilowatt of power to the wheels. Okay. So you just heard power rather than heat, work, or energy. So power is the rate of energy. So do not use this, these equations as is. When you see power, add the dot on top of it. So rate form, okay? Add the dot on top of it everywhere. Then now you have this heat engine analysis in rate form. Now we have joule, uh, we have watt instead of power, uh, instead of joule, okay? So this is a heat engine. So let me uh, make this schematic. HE, this heat engine, observes heat from high temperature thermal energy reservoir and relates that heat into low temperature thermal energy reservoir and, and produce work, W net. However, I told you that it's power rather than energy. So I'm going to add that on top of it. What kind of, you know, the equations that we studied? The energy balance equation, W net is QH minus QL. What is the other one that we studied? The efficiency, desired output over required input, W net over QH. The efficiency is W net over QH. Let's add that on top of it. Now, what is 55 watts? That is the work, that is the power developed by this heat engine. So that is W dot net, 55 kilowatt. Okay, that was simple. Now, to determine the efficiency of this heat engine, we need to know this Q dot H. So let's see. Oh, there's a, some, you know, the, some value looks like a heat, 44 thousand kilojoule per kilogram. So we have 44,000 kilojoule per kilogram. The question you need to ask, is this QH? What is the unit of Q dot H that you expect? Kilowatt, right? Because Q is kilojoule and we have that on top of it. That is the rate of heat transfer. So kilowatt. Joule per second, I'm sorry, kilojoule per second. But that is different from kilojoule per kilogram. So we want to get rid of this kilogram. How? Multiply by kilogram, right? So we can multiply by kilogram to get rid of these kilograms, right? But we still have kilojoule. We want kilowatt. How you convert this kilojoule to kilowatt? Watt is joule per second. That means that divide by second, right? So let's divide by second. So what is, what kind of property is kilojoule, kilogram per second? Yes, mass flow rate. So you need to determine the mass flow rate, multiply by the heating value that will give you Q dot H. So if you are not 100% sure about in any property, always look at the unit and then go from there. So we got the heating value. We, from the heating value, we determine how to determine the rate of heat transfer. So we need what? Mass flow rate. So how do you get mass flow rate? In chapter two, I told you there are two ways to determine the mass, mass flow rate. What are those two? M dot can be determined by density times average velocity times cross-sectional area. Do we have velocity cross-sectional area in this problem statement? No. What is the other way? Density times volumetric flow rate. Do we know the density? Yes. Point A. 
gram per centimeter cube. Again, gram, centimeter. You don't like them, right? So convert them before you put them into the equation. And what about volumetric flow rate? 22 liter per hour. That is the volume per time, right? So let's determine M dot. This M dot, this one, is going to be density. 0.8 gram per centimeter square you don't like gram 1000 gram is one kilogram so you can cross gram out what about centimeters 100 centimeters is one cubing meters i'm sorry 100 centimeter is one meter so 100 cube centimeter cube over one meter cube so you can cross a centimeter cube out. So basically 0.8 times 1 million divided by 1,000. So it's going to be 800 kilogram per cubic meters. If you remember the specific volume of oil, which is similar to hydrocarbon, that is about 0.8 multiplied by 1,000, you get 800. So this is the density. What about volume? 22 liter per hour. 22 liter per hour. You don't like liter. 1,000 liters is one cubic meters. What about hour? One hour is 60 times 60, 3,600 seconds. So you can cross hour, hour, liter, liter. Um, cubic meter, cubic meter. You get kilogram per second. That goes in here. OK? I don't know the value. You have the calculator, so you can calculate that. And then once you put them everything, you get the rate of heat transfer is is what? Two hundred fifteen point. One kilowatt. That goes here. What is the efficiency? 25.6%. Yes. Okay. 22 liter per hour. You, you, do, you want to convert this liter into cubic meters. It's a, it's a volume. Cubic meters is also volume. One cubic meter is 1,000 liter. So if you divide this 22 by 1,000, you get cubic meters. Then one hour is 3,600 seconds. So if you divide this by 3,600, you get second. Okay? So if you do the calculation, I have a calculator here. 0 0.8 divided by 1,000 multiplied by 1 million times 22 divided by 1,000 divided by 3,600, you get 0 0.0049. 0 0.0049. Times 44,000. Okay? So if you don't have this unit conversion, it's very simple. The mass flow rate is given about 0 0.005 times the heating value. You get Q dot 215.1 kilowatt. And then you put the number into the efficiency equation, then you get 25.6%. So as I told you that when you see these, you know, the interesting units, if you complete the unit conversion correctly, the rest of the calculation is very simple. So these two are good examples to show what is the easiest one, what is the hardest one for the heat engine analysis. Either way, the main equation is very simple, either this one or this one. Any question about heat engine? If I give you a problem regarding this heat engine in your second exam, can you solve it? That's the question you need to ask when you practice this problem, okay?
That's everything about heat engine. Any other question in general? Then refrigeration. We have about 15 minutes. So let's talk about the, uh, how this refrigeration cycle works. And we, I don't think we have a time to solve a problem, but, but you know, the, we can continue uh, next Tuesday. Okay, so refrigeration system consists of four thermodynamic devices compressor, evaporator, expansion bath, condenser. It has these names, but these are what you already studied in chapter four. Evaporator is a heat exchanger. Condenser is a heat exchanger. So you have two heat exchangers and compressor and throttling valve. Okay, so we already studied all of them. So what it does is that, you know, the Usually, we want to maintain the refrigerator space at low temperature. Let's say you want to maintain that 3 degrees Celsius. On the other hand, outside of this refrigerator is at high temperature. So, assume that it is about 20 degrees Celsius. So, basically, you want to transfer heat from 3 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius. Is it possible? No, it is not possible because according to the second law of thermodynamics, heat transfer direction is from high temperature to low temperature. This heat transfer direction is the opposite of the law, scientific law, which is not possible. However, we can control the pressure to change the temperature of the refrigerant. So in this case, we can use this compressor to increase the pressure up to 800 kilopascal. If you increase the pressure of a system, then its temperature also goes up. So when you increase the temp pressure up to 800 kilopascal, the temperature of the refrigerant, which is flowing through in this cycle, is going to increase to 60 degrees Celsius. So this is 60 degrees Celsius refrigerant is going to flow, you know, the, under the surface of this refrigerator outside. So it is maintained that 60 degrees Celsius when outside temperature is only 20, then there is a heat transfer from 60 to 20. Which is not against the second law of thermodynamics because this is from high temperature to low temperature. Then we use a throttling valve to decrease pressure. After losing heat from 60 to 20, the temperature of the refrigerant is going to decrease from 60 to 30 at the same pressure. Now you are decreasing pressure by this throttling valve without changing its enthalpy. Then the pressure becomes only 120 and the temperature also drops at the same time down to minus 225 degrees Celsius. This one goes inside the refrigerator, right below the inner surface of the refrigerator. So it will observe heat from the air inside the refrigerator that is maintained at three degrees Celsius. So there's a heat transfer, not from three to 20, only from three to 25, minus 25. So that is that does not violate the second law of thermodynamics. And this minus 25 degrees Celsius refrigerant receiving heat from the refrigerated space. So its temperature goes up from minus 25 to minus 20. Then so now it goes into the compressor, so its temperature goes up to 60, so that you can lose heat naturally and observe heat from naturally. So we control pressure to bring refrigerant to high temperature or low temperature by controlling its pressure. So it does not violate the second law of thermodynamics. But if you don't consider these cycles, it looks like it violates the second law of thermodynamics, heat transfer from three degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius. That's not what happens. There are two, two step heat transfer from 60 to 20, 3 to minus 25, okay? That's how you, we pump heat from low temperature to high temperature, okay? 
then what do we need to study in this chapter five? So previously, in heat engine, we have two thermal energy reservoirs, high temperature thermal energy reservoirs and low temperature thermal energy reservoirs. So we observe heat from high temperature thermal energy reservoirs and produce work, WNET, and any waste heat is gonna be released to low temperature thermal energy reservoirs. So this is, according to the second law of thermodynamics from high temperature, TH to low temperature, TL. So it doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics during this process, we can produce work. On the other hand, refrigeration system, we have two thermal energy reservoirs, high temperature, low temperature. Low temperature is gonna be inside the refrigerator, high temperature is gonna be outside the refrigerator, and the heat transfer direction is the opposite. We observe heat from low temperature thermal energy reservoir, which is refrigerated space, and we pump that heat out of the refrigerator into the kitchen air. So this is from low temperature to high temperature, which is against the second law of thermodynamics. To make that happen, we need to sacrifice something that is the work consumed by compressor, WNET. So in this case, the difference in thermal energy is going to be converted to mechanical energy. So heat engine converts thermal energy into mechanical energy. On the other hand, refrigeration system observes heat. So mechanical energy converted to thermal energy. So these two are similar systems, but we, one is converting thermal energy into mechanical energy. The other one is converting mechanical energy to thermal energy. How do we you know, the, uh, analyze each system? By using energy balance equation. This one, the energy balance equation is gonna be energy transfer in should be the same as energy transfer out. What kind of energy transfer in? We have QH. Energy transfer out, we have WNet going out, QL going out. So this equation becomes WNet is QH minus QL. What about this refrigeration? What is the incoming energy transfer? You can see the direction of arrow, W net goes in, QL goes in, and QH comes out. So if you move this one to the right hand side, we get W net is QH minus QL, which is the same as this one. So both of them use the same energy balance equation. Then what is the difference? The way we analyze the performance, the efficiency of this heat engine is desired output over required input. So desired output is gonna be the work we produce by consuming heat. On the other hand, the performance of this refrigeration system can be determined by what is called coefficient of performance. You will see this, 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 you know, the uh, property when you buy a refrigerator. Of course, higher number is better. That can be determined by desired output over required input. The same, same rule. We just use different name instead of efficiency. We say coefficient of performance or some books like to say beta. They are the same thing. The rule is the same. How much you know the input you need to provide to have how much output? What is the output? What why do we use refrigerator? To consume electricity? No, we want to remove heat from the refrigerated space. So QL is desired output. What is required input? We need to spend electricity. WNet is the required input. So this one gives you the summary of heat engine, the summary of refrigerator, okay?
So on Tuesday, we are going to, you know, the, uh, solve a couple of practice problems for the refrigerator, and then we will study the last system in this chapter five. It is heat pump, which is quite useful in winter to provide heat into the house. So that's everything for today. Any question? Otherwise, see you on Tuesday. Okay. Thank you.